Hey, First Assembly, this is Pastor Wes, and I want to welcome you to Wednesday Word. Hey, listen, it's so good to be with you tonight. And as always, you're watching on Facebook. If you could hit like, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, please hit the subscribe button and comment. Let us know that you're there. Uh, we started a new series a couple weeks ago on detours. You know, what do you do when life takes a turn and uh, we had talked a little bit about the show Seinfeld. It was one of my favorite all-time shows, just brilliantly written. And and the reason that the show was so popular when they because they couldn't figure it out. I mean it was funny, but it wasn't the funniest thing. When they couldn't they they kind of did a study on it. What they found out is people loved the plotless programming. Uh, that the show, literally, they used to joke about it. It was a show about nothing. And it was a joke and yet it was a plotless programmed show and Seinfeld and all the cast and the characters just kind of meandered haplessly from one scene to the next, from one situation to the next situation. And what they discovered was that Americans were fascinated by this because so many of us feel like our lives are in many ways plotless. That we wake up in the morning and just go from situation to situation to situation to circumstance to circumstance and then we go to bed at night exhausted and go, whew, I made it and wake up the next day and do it again. You know, we get through the day by just dealing with whatever comes up and tomorrow we're going to do it again. And, and when you live like this, it's you get through your days, but I'm telling you, all of a sudden, years are crammed in and, and you blink your eyes and there's gray hair and all of a sudden your children are grown and all of a sudden life has changed. And I was laughing with my wife the other day and I said, you know, I used to get hurt when I was young. I, we, we were big bike jumpers. We, I had a huffy and man, we would make ramps and we would jump things and jump stuff and crash our bikes and play parking lot football. And I said, now I, I turned 52 this coming Wednesday or this coming Friday, I'm sorry. And and now, you know, I can hurt myself self by if I sneeze too hard or or if I sleep crooked. And some of you are like sleep crooked, but those of you who know know. You know, you just sleep weird and you wake up in the morning, you're stiff and sore and you pulled a muscle. I mean, it's just there, there's got to be more to life. There has to be more to life. Uh, than just going from situation and si to situation, circumstance to circumstance, and waking up one day and years have passed. I, I just think there has to be a, a way to live intentional, a way to live my life on point. And, you know, what if, what if uh, the hand of God, you know, we've all had services that we felt the presence of God. We've all had moments in our lives that we felt the hand of God on us. What if the hand of God was on us, not just at camps or retreats or special services or special moments, but literally every day that we live, that God was with you in it and through it? And think about this. You know, when do we struggle the most? Um, we struggle the most when we feel alone, when we feel isolated, when we feel overwhelmed. Uh, when we feel like no one is looking, when we, when we kind of feel like, like no one cares, those are the times that often we struggle the most. And the truth is that you can hide from people if you want to, uh, and you can keep people at a distance if you want to, and only let them see what you want them to see. We can use a lot of energy just managing our image for people to see. So we want to create this picture. But if you really believe that God is with you each day and in everything, that He is with you now and what you're facing and what you're feeling, I think it will change the way you live, and it will change the way you handle everything that rises up. Uh, can you imagine going through your day uh, with a physical Jesus with you? I mean, wouldn't you walk different? You know, if you're going to school and Jesus goes to school with you like a guest, wouldn't you do school differently? When you got up this morning and went to your job and, and Jesus tagged along, I mean, wouldn't you, wouldn't you walk differently and work differently and speak differently? Wouldn't it affect the way that you lived out your day? Because I think it would. I think we would talk differently if Jesus was sitting there. I think we might watch different things if Jesus was in the room. I think there's probably some conversations that we probably wouldn't get in 
into if Jesus was sitting there going, hey, Wes, that's gossip. Why are you gossiping? Wes, that's not true. That's that, you, you know that's not true. You know, wouldn't it affect the way that we practically lived our lives? If he was there, it would impact how you faced and handled conflict. And I can't help but think it would change the way that we live. And, and what's so good about this, I think is unique about this, is the reality that he is with us. His presence is with us and in us through it all. And so the purpose that God gives each of us, you know, in our lives, while there may be some pain in it and going through it, I know that it's going to be worth it. Um, and so what God brings to my life and brings my life to um, is in his hands and is intentional. There's always a reason and a purpose behind it. And, uh, and again, like a mom in labor, you know, there's pain. But when that baby is laid in her arms, it's worth it all. You know, purpose doesn't make things hurt less, but it does make the pain worth the results. And, and that's what Jesus said, for the joy set before him. He, he endured the cross. There was nothing about the cross that was comfortable or easy. He didn't enjoy it. He endured it. You know, when there is purpose, we work through things. You know, you keep going even when there are setbacks, even when you face fears, even when there are disappointments. You don't stop moving forward uh, in Him because there's a purpose behind it. Uh, and because there's a reason, there's something on the other side that's going to be worth it all. You know, having purpose in your life is a powerful thing. And so we shared that sometimes things take a turn and there are detours that arise in our lives, uh, but the destination doesn't change. And so we define destiny as this. Destiny is the customized life calling for which God has equipped and ordained you in order to bring the greatest glory and maximum expansion of his kingdom. And, uh, and the foundation of all of our lives, when you woke up this morning, I woke up this morning, you know, the very first thing that our lives are and are to be about is to bring God glory and to make his name known. You know, I am his. I am a reflection of the Father, and God wants me to reflect his love and his nature and his character to a hurting and a lost world, to people whom I know know and love and the people whom I don't know, but he loves, you know, we are to be a reflector. So all of our purpose and our destiny start there. You know, to bring God glory is to give God such a place in our lives that the people that we come in contact with, you know, by our words or actions, uh, will see his presence. Will will experience him. You know, I pray this over my, my son every day when I drop him off at school. Let our words be building. Let our lives be edifying of people and may people see Christ in us. You know, it's practically got to be walked out. And so my dad says it this way, to become living word, that we take the scriptures and we put them inside of us and a, they become, they, they work inside of us so that when people see you, they see the word of God being lived. And, and that's incredibly attractive for a world that needs the Lord. You know, to find your destiny, you really have to find God. It's not looking for a thing. It's not looking for a moment. It's looking for him because he's the one who created you. He fashioned you. And so we draw close to him and we know his heart and be able to hear his voice in the midst of all the other voices. Uh, the other day I got to go to um, uh, the Green Bay Packers versus the Washington Commanders game. And, uh, you know, 40, 50,000, however many people were there. Uh, you know, everyone's yelling and cheering and all sorts of things. And sometimes life feels there's just so many voices around us. Um, and yet God says in the midst of all of the voices, I want you to hear my voice because I'm going to tell you the way. I'm going to show you the way. I'm going to give you the promise and I'm going to tell you what to do. And I'll get you through, not just to go, whew, I survived, but I'll get you through in a way that we kind of go, thank you, God, for the life you've given me. You know, I don't think God wants to move in the shadows. I don't think God wants this hidden from us. God doesn't want to be confusing or unclear as to what he's called us to do. I think he wants you to know and be able to walk in confidence because we have heard him. You know, Proverbs 3, 3, uh, 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. You know, sometimes we just say, God, I just, I don't know what you want me to do here. And so when I hear that, I don't know what you want me to do here. When we really do or we don't really trust him. Uh, you know, do we trust the Lord? 
Uh, how many of you have had something you felt the Lord kind of spoke to you about? You kind of felt like God said this. And I, I know it was the Lord. I understand his leading. I understand his His presence. He, he touched my heart. He kind of, you know, flipped that little thing inside that switch. I said, hey, you know, pick up the phone and make the call. I want you to go talk to this person. I want you to pray for this person. And we kind of knew it was something God was saying. And it was clear enough that you would tell someone, I really feel the Lord impressed me to do this. I want to ask you, what are you doing with it? Have you picked up the phone and called them? Have you, have you gone and talked with them? Have you been praying for them? Because trust, if we're going to say we trust in the Lord, trust trusts. Uh, it leans on Him. You know, if I have heard Him and I'm doing nothing with it, do I really trust Him in it? Uh, and so, uh, you know, do I, do I depend on me too much? Do I depend on my wisdom and my experience and, and my knowledge and my emotions? Do I depend on me too much in my life? You know, my ability to stay in the boat when God's called me to get out and, and walk on water. You know, do I really seek Him about the issues and the direction of my life? Uh, or do I just kind of get up in the morning and go from situation to situation and try to handle all that comes, you know, as best I can and reflect Jesus circumstance to circumstance and deal with whatever goes on. But if you end up living like that and doing things like that, functioning like that, I, I just think that there are things um, that get wasted um, because we didn't seek him. You know, there, there are times in your life and my life, I look back and go, man, that was a wasted season. Uh, that was wasted time. That was wasted emotion. Um, I gave it to the wrong stuff, you know. And if you ever felt like it, it, it's wasted stuff that makes it feel pointless, well, it's because it is. You know, um, if I'll seek him and live intentionally, I end up in the right stuff, doing the right things. Uh, and, and, and experience Him in, in a new way. And so I think this stuff matters. Uh, I do think this stuff matters. Pray about what God would have you do and do it. Um, you know, listen, two quick things. You know, are there things that you are doing that God would have you not do? I want to ask you that. Are there things in your life you say, you know what, Pastor Royce, there are some things God's dealing with me about, convicting me about, that God's asking me to, to remove or cut out or to lay down or walk away from. Um, God's asking me to adjust some things in my life. All right, this is, if there's things he's talking to you about, what are you doing with it? And are there things that he's asking you to do that you haven't done yet? Uh, I think these things matter. You know, I'm a simple man and I like simple things. Um, and I know that when I walk in what I know he has spoken to me about, I know I walk differently. It's a different level of peace. It's a different level of confidence. It's just a different level of anointing in obedience. And it doesn't make things easier. You know, it just makes me more determined and more confident uh, and more at peace with what comes. And, and I want you to get this because each one of you are a masterpiece. You know, we looked at that there are no off the shelf people. God didn't make a generic you. You are handmade. You are custom made. You know, he fashioned you and what you do is important to him and what you do is important to the body of Christ. You know, your talents, your abilities, your gifting make lives better. Um, you were designed for that, to bring him glory in the way he designed you. And, and when we don't do that, when I don't function in the way God's created me and gifted me, I think we don't, uh, you know, the, the, the body of Christ can miss that. It's like having, uh, you know, an organ that stops working. It's like, you know, laying on the couch too long and your leg goes to sleep. You get up and try to walk. You're not walking right because your leg isn't functioning the way it's supposed to function. So knowing what God has said to us and walking in it will get us through a lot of challenging times. Things that uh, without purpose we would have given up on, but with purpose we press through. We, we, we fight the fight. You know, there are good works, Scripture says, that have been prepared for us in advance. And what that means is that God took into consideration your skill set and how you were gifted and your personality that he gave you and he's prepared things for you that you are perfectly suited for to succeed in by doing what? By being you obedient to him. Um, and, and that ought to make you feel great. I'm just telling you stuff that comes to our life. God's got you. God's prepared you. God is with you. 
And so when I function the way that God's created me to, when I move in the gifting and the abilities he's given me and do so obedient to his word and being led by his spirit, God receives the glory and people are blessed and I am blessed, even in the detours. Uh, because what if the things that are a detour to you, you know, a turn you didn't see coming or a situation you didn't see coming is part of God's perfect plan being worked out in your life? You know, and it's often in the detours that we get things ironed out. You know, my faith is stretched. Uh, my, 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 my confidence grows. Um, you know, uh, we, when we overcome things, we grow spiritually more mature and stronger. And, and I think sometimes detours that we want to complain about and go, oh, why me? God says, I put in your path because I'm growing you up. I'm teaching you something in this. You know, I grow more mature in who he has created to, me to be. Uh, often in detours because detours have a purpose and we can all go back and look and see how God has worked some things out in our lives you know and then in the moment you look back and go gosh I remember when that first was happening oh I hated it, it was miserable I'm like why do we have to move or why did I lose my job or why did they break up with me or why you know all this stuff but now looking back you see the full story or at least more of the story and you kind of go thank God we moved Thank God, God removed that person from my life and God brought someone who is more, more into my life. And I thank God for that, you know, being able to look and to see these things. And so, you know, maybe it didn't feel good to start uh, or as we were in it, but now you look back and you see it was a good experience in your life. I'm glad that happened. You know, well, what about bad experiences? Can God use bad experiences? to accomplish his will in us. And, and by that I mean this, our mistakes, our failures, um, our sin, times when we knew the right thing and didn't choose the right thing, can God use those? Can God use the consequences? Um, can God use the regrets that we sometimes have? You know, can God use those things that were our choice? Um, you know, Peter, when you look at the life of Peter, kind of thought he had it all together. He was better than everybody else, loved Jesus more, and, and yet he was the one, Luke 22, who denied Jesus three times. Uh, three different situations, man. And, and the last time he denied him, and the rooster crows, and Peter looks, and Jesus is close enough to see him, and they make eye contact. And, and Peter runs out and weeps bitterly. I mean, it was just in that moment, you talk about a failure. You know, you talk about a mess up. Um, that's 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 his man, and and it's pretty bad. And you know, Jesus looks at him, and it says this in Luke twenty two sixteen and sixty one. But Peter said, "Man, I don't know what you're talking about." <clears throat> and immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And at that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and suddenly, the Lord's words flash through Peter's mind before the rooster crows tomorrow morning. You will deny me three times that you even know me. Can you imagine that? Uh, denying Jesus in front of Jesus where he can see you? Um, oh, that would just die. I would die. And yet, I want to ask you this. When you sin, when we choose to do things, say things, think things, look at things contrary to the word of God, where is Jesus when we do that? He's not just in front of us, but he's within us, you know. He's there. Um, and so when I sin, when I fall, when I fail, he's there with me, in me. And, and because God loves and because God understands purpose and because God says, listen, I know you have fallen, but I can heal and redeem and lift you up. God can take a failure and turn it around, and God did it in Peter's life. He used it to humble Peter and prepare him for ministry and used him to strengthen other believers. You know, is that what happened when we fail? Is that what happened when we stumble? Is that what happens when we fall short? Are we humbled? You know, are we prepared or, or sent? Or do I deny and hide and justify you know, do I blame other people? You know, uh, so how did God do this in the life of Peter? After Peter had, had failed, denied Jesus three times, he just kind of went back to what he knew. He went back to fishing. And one day he's fishing. He looks up and he sees Jesus on the shore and he recognizes Jesus and he jumps in, swims to shore. And it says that Jesus was cooking fish over coal. Now, there's only two times, I believe, that, that, that this word in the Greek is used. One 
is where Jesus is cooking fish over a coal for Peter to eat. And the other one was when Peter was standing by a fire and the word that they use, a coal fire, warming himself when he denied Jesus. And so uh, it's really unique that to bring healing, God kind of took him back to a place of his failure. God says, you denied me at a coal and I'm going to meet you and heal you around some coals. And so, uh, and as he talks with Peter, you know, Peter, do you love me? And I can't imagine, you know, when you're guilty, you're always ready to move on. You know, the person who's guilty is always ready to move forward. Uh, but Jesus loves him too much to leave that in his heart. And so he reaches in and elevates it. And, and when he's starting to talk to Peter, you know what I don't see in the life of Peter is I don't hear excuses. Uh, I don't see him denying now. I don't see him pointing the finger. Uh, Peter owned his stuff and Peter was humbled. And God used it to prepare him to do ministry and we're going to use him to reach the Gentile people. Uh, the thing about bad experiences is this. Learn from your failures and their consequences and be humble so that God can use them for your good. If we give those to the Lord, um, God can turn them around and use them for your good. But if we're not humbled and we just make excuses and blame other people, then we tend to repeat these things. We tend to go back through the pain and go back through the struggle and fall again down the road uh, and, and, and do that. So those about that. What about bitter experiences? Bitter experiences are similar to bad experiences, but they're a little bit different. Can God use bitter experiences? Uh, bitter experiences tend to be things that happen to us that aren't necessarily done by us. Uh, abandonment, um, abuse, uh, neglect, injustice, um, sickness those type things. And, and, you know, we on Sundays have been walking through the life of Joseph and, and Joseph didn't really, you know, he had some things happen to him that weren't really his choice. He didn't sign up for stuff. Uh, he mishandled some things and there were consequences, but he, he didn't allow the bitterness to take over his life. And he was treated poorly. He was lied about, but in and through it all, he just kept God at the center and he forgave. And then God in his perfect timing, when Joseph was ready, and his brothers were ready, and his father was ready, elevates Joseph and brings him to the point that he's able to say with a clear spirit, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Um, and some of the primary things that God uses to help grow us and discover our purpose and destiny are good experiences, bad experiences, and bitter experiences in our lives. And, and I guess what I'm saying is God can use anything God can use it all. God has the ability to take our mess and make it more. He can make it a miracle. And, and I, yet one of the reasons why people stay stuck in a detour is because they often don't learn from their stuff. You know, if you get on a, on a circle, you've got to get off of it or you're going to keep going around and around and around. So we have to learn. We have to humble ourselves. We have to let God teach us and show us, um, you know, if you're living your whole life and, and, and blaming everybody else and things are never your fault and you're always the victim and, and I won't forgive them, then I'm, fr friend, you're stuck. You're stuck in a place. You're stuck on the road. You're stuck in the circle because those kind of things will keep you on the detour until you're ready to learn and heal and be redeemed and forgive. You know, like a car has to be in alignment to drive properly. We've got to be in spiritual alignment with God to move forward healthy. Jesus said in John 15, 5, Yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Um, you know, I, I read this thing the other day. I was talking about garage doors and how for a garage door to work on each side of it, there are these little mechanisms that shoot a beam and the beams have to be in alignment for the door to go up and the door to come down. And if they're not in alignment, it won't work. You know, we went out and one of the kids had pulled the lawnmower out and had knocked that thing just off beam. And they're like, Dad, the door won't go up. The door won't go up. We go out, as soon as you got it back into alignment, the door functions. You know, sometimes we get on detours and we get stuck because we're not in alignment with God. And, and I say this of marriages all the time. You know, you, you talk to a couple um, that, that are in, you know, having arguments and whatnot. And usually both of them can identify the problem. You know, when something's broken, you can say, this is, bu this is broken. Uh, but what happens a lot of time, the conflict isn't in identifying the problem. The conflict is finding solution because if the husband and wife aren't in unity, if they're on opposite sides of the issue, the solutions are going to look different. And that's where a lot of people argue. 
We argue about power, how we're going to do it. And what happens is this. If you've got to get people to come around and stand together, because once you're in unity looking at the problem, then they're your partner, not your adversary. And then the solutions start looking a lot more alike, and there's synergism, and you're stronger together than you are individually. You know, and the same is true of God, man. When I'm in alignment with God, I just walk stronger. And so do you. I can walk in tune. Doors will open that have been closed before because alignment matters. You know, when we aren't in alignment, we miss signals. Uh, we, we, God says stop and I don't hear it. I run the spiritual red light or wait or turn here or apply for that job. When we don't have the leading of the Holy Spirit to position us right where we need to be, uh, and, you know, we, we end up wasting a lot of time in our lives guessing or just going with the flow and hoping things work out. You know, I have Dish TV, and so it works great. Uh, I love it unless there's a snowstorm or heavy rain. Then it messes up the signal, and if the signal is messed up, I get nothing. You know, I think God is always speaking. God is always talking. God is always leading. His Holy Spirit is always with us. His presence is always within us. And when I abide in His presence, I feel like God will speak to us. God will lead us and guide us. Um, but if I'm out of alignment, those things become much harder in my life. Uh, the Lord sent Paul and Bartimaeus uh, or set them apart while they were worshiping. You know, Acts 13, 2 and 3. One day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I've called them. And so after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. Listen, God will give you guidance while we are often practicing spiritual disciplines, which is the realities of saying, I'm going to control my physical and do things spiritually to grow intentionally, all right? Worship, fasting, prayer. And when you think about them, I'm like, what is worship? Worship is, is positioning. Worship is seeing God for who he is and seeing that he is greater than all I face. It brings us in focus. It brings us into alignment so that we can hear him. It's an acknowledgement of who he is and what he has done and believing <clears throat> for what he'll do in the future. God can speak and God does speak. Are you in position to hear him? If we feel out of alignment, worship, prayer, fasting, uh, a Bible study, those things bring us back into alignment so that it works properly. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, So dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and a holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think, and then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. It is in his presence that changes the way we think about things and puts me in alignment to know God's will for my life, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. And when my mind and thoughts are focused on the wrong direction and the wrong things, it's hard to find your destiny. It's struggle. It feels pointless. All right? And we tend to go from just detour to detour. I'm going to close with this. Even in dark places, God has a plan for your life. Uh, no matter where you are tonight, no matter what has gone on or what you're in or just coming out of or feel like you're just going into, God has a plan and a purpose for your life and God has hope for us all. It's not about finding an exit ramp to get out of it. It is about finding Him and He will lead you. Trust His prep and trust His timing. Search for the Lord and you will find Him, I promise you. First Assembly, I love you and I bless you and I pray that you have a great week. We look forward to seeing you at church on Sunday. It's going to be a great, great day. God bless you. You have a right good evening.